All right, guys, so you're joining me today for the Imperfectly Perfect podcast, and I have got an incredible episode with such an inspirational lady that I was fortunate, fortunate enough to meet over in LA, and she flew from Arizona. So, Letitia Fry, thank you for joining me today. Thanks, Glenn. It's good to see you again, sort of. <laughs> yeah, virtually. I know we're all in uh, pretty much lockdown. But what I wanted to start off with was just talking a little bit about you, about your career, because um, as we know, the whole notion and the premise behind Imperfectly Perfect is to really kind of de-celebritize what people portray public figures or influential public figures to be and what they think they know about them by an online persona. Ah. Okay. Um, so yeah, so, so basically when it comes down to Letitia, she is an influential speaker, auctioneer, highly sought after in America, entertainer and author to her new book, which I um, promoted the other day. It is incredible. It's called No Reserve. And it's Take Ownership and Live Your Life Without Limitations. And I suppose why I wanted to touch upon your book, first of all, was because, again, attributing to the campaign, you really do have to work on that mindset and taking ownership to get through severe adversity and really change things around. And I always say, and I've said it in a lot of podcasts to a lot of people, nobody can ever hurt you as much as you can hurt yourself. That's, yeah. So, Absolutely. The, in, in, in speaking of that, and forgive me for the audience, every once in a while I'm gonna have to flip up because it means someone's trying to get a hold of me. Um, <laughs> you know, Glenn, you just touched on something really important. We should probably just start right in here. Not only that no one can hurt you as much as you can hurt yourself, you actually can't change anyone but yourself, and no one can save you but yourself. Mm -hmm. So in diving into my career, for those of you that are listening, um, Alice Cooper is one of my dear friends, him and his wife Cheryl, and also you know wrote uh, forward in the book or, or a piece of the book. But um, about 10 years ago or so, he dubbed me the auction tainer because I have a theater background from the University of Southern California and am a classically trained auctioneer. And when he saw me, he was like, it's kind of like a rock star, meaning I don't use notes, I go all over. So for those of you in Australia or wherever you are joining in. In America, I'm known as the foremost auction tainer because I really develop entertainment into nonprofit fundraising events, which do these huge galas all over the country for mega rock stars and football stars and, you know, uh, big time celebrities raising money for different causes, which as you can imagine from where you're going, since we're in a world history moment right now, my industry, because it means thousands of people gathering in a ballroom or in a concert venue has gone flat. So um, in keeping with that, know that that um, is one of the pivots that I'm dealing with right now that I'd like to address as well that comes with mental health on being able to actually pivot through the various parts or challenges in your life. The book that Glenn's referring to, No Reserve, I'll be honest with you, I'd like to tell you I wrote it. I'm going to be, whether you know, you're a God person or not, I'm just going to go say source, God, whatever works for you. Let's just say that that book is written by a series of things that came into my life that I not only went to decided to go through, but I actually would grow through. And I can tell you that the reason I say I didn't write the book, I did, but uh, the problem is, is that um, everything I went through now makes sense to me. So I kind of feel like God wrote the book. The source wrote the book. Um, it is the book that I needed to read. That's that's the truth in the matter of it. I wrote down um, a brief synopsis for those of you that don't know me. Um, it has now been five years in November. I'm an avid runner, and I was out running on an American holiday, Thanksgiving in the morning, and I was struck by a car. Um, in being struck by the car, I went several feet in the air, I landed on my head, and I split my head completely open and suffered a traumatic brain injury. Subsequently, following that, that meant vertigo, seizures, um, just a plethora of, of, of a nightmare. I lost my hearing in my right ear, my eyesight in my right eye, stuttering. So uh, again, what one would call an adversity or definitely a step into life that was unexpected. Prior to that, earlier in my life, I did marry the love of my life that we met when we were in our teens, um, early in college, which I consider myself in teens, you know, kind of young adulthood, childhood, whatever. Um, and through a series of things, we would no longer be married. However, we did remain best friends. And that divorce also is for many people that are out there, there are a lot of catalysts into what will take you into depression or mental health issues um, that oftentimes people feel they shouldn't share. So what I want to start with is just kind of giving you a quick synopsis of some of the things that I have um, had adversity come in my life that I now see as blessings, but to kind of help you understand where my health and mental health journey came from. 
So the first being a divorce, it's, it's a really like a jarring experience. We were married for 13 years, but together for 20. So you have that. Um, about, I would say, six years or so past that divorce, still best friends. I then get hit by the car. Um, I become uh, mentally, physically incapacitated in a career where I have to be on stage um, and hit a lot of that. And then eight months after that happened, that very person I'm discussing, my former husband, shot himself. Um, we have two children and um, he died in a series of complications financially. So he left not only physically, emotionally, financially, mentally, all of it gone. Um, that then was dumped upon my plate. After that, um, about 14 months after he um, passed, I fell in love again with a wonderful man with two children and we blended our lives. Um, a year or so, a year and a half into that relationship, his son um, had died by suicide. So once again, adversity showed up. And then the final straw to that was um, the grief would become insurmountable and our relationship would fall apart. And ultimately I would leave that relationship in the hopes that perhaps that might be the catalyst to fix it and he would leave and ultimately walk away from both of us. So basically you add in um, abandonment on top of that. So the reason I tell you this is because by no means do I feel anyone is defined. We all have stories. I don't think you're defined by them. What I think you're defined by is how you react to your story. And that's really more um, what I seek to address. We all have adversities and certainly right now in the world, we literally all have an adversity. Um, <clears throat> pertaining to mental health, as you can see that there were several cases that I mentioned through this where people um, ended their lives, which is very tragic and leads behind a lot of grief for those of us that are left here to deal with. Um, in the midst of all this, and one of the things that Glenn knows that I wanted to talk about is that about a year plus ago, um, some clients started to try to get me to play a little more. And again, I'm going to go on record. I am not, nor was I raised, um, and I, I call just Christmas Christians. You know, you go on Christmas, maybe on Easter. Um, we, we weren't by any means um, extraordinarily religious people by, um, by sort of practice, if you would. Very spiritual and whatnot, and given the freedom to find our own. So when I talk about God, for me, source, I also study Zen, as, you know, Buddhism, Christianity, Muslim. I have friends of every Judaism and, and respect many of the different practices in all. But for me in the past year and a half, what it has been has been a dive into myself and in doing so also studying the history, literally historical books and accounts on the development and history of say Jesus as a man in when he was born to die as a historical figure, take religion out, studying uh, 400 years later at the birth of Roman Catholicism, in the year 600, the birth of Muslim. I, I happen to be fascinated by these things. Um, and I find that there are many different ways that resonate with people on how they utilize that to maintain mental health. Because let's face it, a, um, a relationship with God um, or a relationship with a religion for you um, may be a great way for, to maintain a good sense of mental health. So please don't think by any means that this is going to be a religious podcast, but I do need to point out to you that this was a journey to the self for me. And the self for me is to get back to the source from which I come, whether you want to call that source, love, God, entirely up to you. So let's talk about that journey. Um, when I first met Glenn, I had been told through some mutual friends after a very honest post on my Instagram, I, I'm really just brutally honest. And if you DM me, you, you get me. Um, and one of the people had said, you know, I, I was very honest about the fact that um, people like myself, that um, they would look a certain way, dress a certain way, get on stage. People assume we have no problems. Or even if we have problems, they might not ever get to that level. So, okay, so maybe you didn't realize the adversities I faced. Those sound like major problems, but that's not really what would take me down. It is all ultimately about the relationship to yourself. So for me, many of us right now are going through what we call self-quarantine or self-isolation. In my line of work, for, to do 113 different performances of raising funds all over the country means being alone on a plane. It means being alone on a stage. It means being alone in a hotel room afterwards. And there's a tremendous amount of isolation. In that time period, about a year and a half ago, some clients suggested I learn to pray, really because I'm not a good meditator, I'm very ADD. Um, and so prayer kind of seemed a great way to sort of focus my mind, if you would, quiet it down. So I started that practice, and what I didn't know is about 14 months ago, I started on the journey to me. Um, great song, 
In fact, it's in Priscilla Queen of the Desert. I've been to paradise, but I've never really been to me. So this is sort of my um, journey to me. In this past 14 month period, the breakup was nine months ago, I went through what I would call a dark journey of the soul. So let's come touch on that for a moment and that brings back in Glenn. I made a very honest post in this time period when I was struggling with my own emotions, pardon me for that, that people were like, well, what do you mean you feel that way? So what I said is that people like myself have dark thoughts even life ending thoughts, but it doesn't mean I'm going to act on them. But just because I won't act on them doesn't mean I don't have them. It was that post that then had me introduced to Gwen and I decided, you know what, this is worth it. I'm off work. It's the holidays. I'm going to hop on a one hour flight and go meet he, his wife and his children and be a part of this campaign. For those of you that are new to this campaign, it involved, okay, so today I have a little makeup on, not a lot, hanging out in my dress, but it meant coming in raw. It meant coming in, you know, no makeup. It's imperfectly perfect. And it meant going back as Glenn continued to snap pictures of me going back to the day that I found out that Steve shot himself. The day that I found out that my, um, what would have been my stepson was found by the man I loved. Um, those moments in time. And as I went back to that pain, the tears can come up even right now really, really easily. <clears throat> and Glenn has a, in brilliant eye and capturing that. So you'll see some really raw images of me and then we simply just spoke about what the impact of those have meant. But I think that a lot of that has been about how I've been able to express through a book, through speaking and through podcasts like this about the different people in my life who chose the ultimate answer, the permanent answer to a temporary problem. And that is to choose to end one's life. What I haven't ever discussed, which I will do for the first time here today, is my own journey into what I consider the dark journey of the soul and the very moment that I faced myself with the same decision, but how I feel a little differently about it. So as we go into this, let's first talk about um, depression. A lot of you, both on your continent and mine, um, in the state of Arizona right now, we're on voluntary. It's up to us um, to self-quarantine, but in other states, they're mandatory. So there's three major things, and look, and I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but these are common. You can find them in sermons, you can find them in doctorates. There's three major parts that, come, that actually contribute to normal depression. Now, when I say normal, I mean not due to a chemical imbalance. I mean what makes a perfectly kind of what you think is a normal person like Glenn's friend, who on Instagram or social media one day is fine, and a week later he finds out he's taken his life. What are some of those factors? The first one is fear. Fear is actually the base of anxiety. Where does it come from? I don't know what's happening next. Do you think across the world people might be feeling a little bit of fear right now? 100%. Some very healthy, normal people who have never even really been able to identify what depression is are going to hit some of these points, which is why Glenn and I decided this was a pretty important podcast to do today. The first one is fear and anxiety. That comes from, I don't, I don't know what to do. I can't control it. That is where we are at today, and that is one of the main contributors to a normally person that you would think, oh, they look great, and the next day they're like, what's going on with me? What's the second one? The second one is when something doesn't come to fruition. I, I wouldn't so much as call it disappointment as almost um, my mother once used to say, anticipation is greater than realization. It's something you built up in anticipation in your mind that didn't come to pass. Let's take, for example, the Olympic athletes right now. That's someone that's probably got it together. You wouldn't think depression would really hit them. They've been training for possibly a lifetime and just found out it will be postponed. That sort of a letdown is a hotbed welcome to the world of depression. Also for myself, I have a senior in high school. Prom has been canceled. It looks like uh, graduation is gonna be canceled. And there are a lot of teens out there that really sort of identified with these things and now they're gone. So those are two major factors, fear, uncertainty, and the letdown of things that you really counted on to sort of make life norm. The third one is probably the most impactful and it's definitely something that resonated with me on my journey and that is rejection. Rejection ultimately by a loved one, by a partner, by a colleague, by a friend, um, is the ultimate sort of chip away at self-worth and self-value. So if you want to look at what depression is from that, and I apologize, people keep trying to text me in this. Um, if you want to look at 
there's three factors, fear and the anxiety of uncertain and the unknown, the disappointment of something not coming to pass and the rejection by a loved one, that can pretty much encompass any one of us right now. This virus has leveled the world, not just one country, the world into a space where any one of us is actually susceptible to depression right now, and rightfully so. So <clears throat> being able to identify that is probably one of the first and most powerful tools you can have. So for me, um, when it came down to identify what's going on with me, is this grief? Am I in some sort of PTSD? I actually was in the third part, which was rejection. Because truthfully, when I ended my relationship, my hopes were that person would say, okay, I'm gonna take this time to go better myself and come back, and then we can work this out, and instead just walked away. That triggered for me a lot of um, my sense of self, um, validation. And so what also happens, and what might happen to many of you right now in isolation, when we stay busy and we have our day-to-day -day lives and what we identify with, it's easy to kind of keep stepping through life and moving forward. But what happens when there's a sudden halt, and in this case, a halt like what we're going through unexpectedly as a world, all of those emotions will catch up with you. And so for me, those three things I mentioned, being hit by a car, the death of my former husband, the death of what would have been my stepson, I have done some grieving, but I actually did a lot of shelving of those feelings. So along comes the little thing, the thing that didn't seem so big, like I'm just gonna end this relationship and wham, I get leveled because all of it rolls into one. So here's what I learned about my own journey. I started out through a lot of deep therapy, self-reflection and self-understanding to peel back the layers of myself. I have not dated in the entire nine month period since this happened because I'll be honest with you, since I was a teenager, I've never gone more than four months without a boyfriend or a man in my life. So the identity of what I'm trying to say, if I've never taken the journey to me, this is I really haven't. So I started in therapy. I started through deep dives of journaling and books and trying to understand how do I tick? Because the one thing I can tell you unequivocally, no matter what relationship you're in, whether it is a, an employee relationship, a brother, sister, familiar relationship, a relationship with a wife or husband, there is no human being you can change but you. The only thing that you can change in a relationship manner is your reaction to it. So let's kind of break that down. So here I go on this deep dive to the self and I'm in therapy and I start peeling back layers of where the rejection comes from, from an early childhood divorce, not one of these, oh, I'm blaming, blaming. No, 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 no. Just why do I tick the way I tick? That's really the question. Okay, so there's some identif identification issues with a father that was absent and then there's some identification issues from my relationship with my mom, myself. I had an eating disorder when I was a teenager. Um, body dysmorphia, I know is something Glenn is very honest about. Uh, eating disorder for me was bulimia and anorexia, which is really just a way to numb out and keep everyone away. Um, I don't wanna feel and I don't wanna be with you, which all of this, again, all these things we hide. So for me, as I peeled back all these layers, I suddenly had this giant breakthrough in therapy of wow, I, get it. I so understand why I have done everything I've done and repeated it. Because you will continue to attract lessons in your life until you learn them over and over, either through different people, different situations, they'll keep coming back. So <clears throat> you wait for this big aha moment. One would think on the path to enlightenment or the path to um, what others consider a union with God or the source of self, that this would be like, yay, I did it. It's actually possibly one of the most depressing moments you'll ever have in your life. Because with this reveal of what your ego has been doing your entire life, everything you identify with, I, the auction tainer, I, this person, this ego over here is suddenly broken down and I'm left just with me. Instead of feeling this moment of great relief, what I realize is that pretty much every part of my life has almost been a giant joke on me. It's literally almost been like a play that I was directing, only the joke was on me. So what happens is this space that you create between the ego and the self is just that dead space. It's sitting in the calm. It's terrifying. So this is the first time I've come open with this and be very honest with you. I was traveling to an event in Atlanta and um, I always volunteer for the people that I am with. And so I had spent this really emotional night with severe PTSD soldiers 
that had come back. And I don't mean even average PTSD. I mean, they actually have to be put away for six months out of danger of killing themselves or others. Um, and so I spent the night with them and I really picked up a lot of their intense emotion. And the next night I found myself, um, had sat down in prayer and I'd had a glass of wine. I, I, that's it. Just one glass of wine sitting there. And it was really a weird feeling. And all of a sudden it was almost like a sweet song, an idea. I looked over at the glass and I thought, well, I've been to Jewish weddings before. I, I've seen where they break the glass and there's a bath mat right there and there's a tub. It wasn't like, you know, a desperate situation, a depressed situation. It was almost like a sweet song. I almost call it like the devil song. And if you will, for me, um, I'm a theater major and a film buff. I love both the book and the movie. Um, the book is called The Heart of Darkness. The movie is called Apocalypse Now. And there is a scene with Martin Sheen in there where he faces himself this very moment in the mirror. And you'll see him, he punches the mirror through. And that's sort of the dark journey of the soul. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. So here I was alone. And this sweet idea comes in my head. So I got up, I wrapped that glass um, in the bath mat and I smashed it because it's quiet when you do that. And I took a piece out and I thought about it. A single mom, two kids, their father's gone. No, I won't do that. But there it was, and that's my most important key part about this. No, I wouldn't do that. In fact, if anything, I got pretty pissed off about it, but that doesn't mean the thought didn't come. It also doesn't mean that I can't be honest about having it, even if I overcame it. So instead, pardon me for that, what I did was very um, Martin Sheen-like, I went to the mirror in the bathroom, I'll be totally honest, no clothes on, took a good look at myself. I um, took that piece of glass to my arm up here. I have tattoos, as many of you can see. It's hard to see the scar here now, I'm amazed how well it has healed. I took that piece of glass, looked myself in the mirror, and said, if this is the devil, um, F you. And so I took it in once. I took it in once above and once above that for my children, and I said, you know what? I don't have a tattoo to get right now, but I'm gonna keep this scar with pride because that's the closest you're ever going to get. And from that day forward, I made a commitment to myself, to my family, that although I understood and heard the sweet song of the devil's invitation, I refused to take it. And I have had many a friends come forward, including my own daughter who struggled with depression after we lost her father, that said, yeah, mom, that's a really good description of what it's like. It's not like, um, it's almost like a sweet idea, like someone's whispering it in your ear. So if that was what I came as close to that with, if you were someone that didn't have the sources or resources or wherewithal to recognize that, yeah, you'd be gone you'd be gone. And that's why it's so important to understand. It's a very real um, sensation. I didn't find it really a disturbing sensation, which is odd. And some of you might think, well, you know, I'm not a cutter. I don't self-harm. I'm not any of that. Why would I do that? I do have different tattoos on my body that signify different moments in my life of achievement or promises to God. And so I chose to um, basically make a mark for myself on that day. And what happened on that day is I had a complete turnaround. Um, for those of you that are wondering and studying a little more about what the dark journey of the soul means, um, there is, you can actually look into books on what's called the dark night, the dark journey, Roman Catholicism dips into it, um, St. John dips into it, a book, a three-part book, uh, St. Teresa, not Mother Teresa, St. Teresa of the 19th century nun talks about it. What it refers to is a period in time in life where you're lost between what is really the ultimate source of yourself or God and you. Now, if you're someone that's into Zen or Buddhism, it's basically the part that they talk about um, in Buddhism, uh, life is suffering. And so in the part where you're trying to get to enlightenment is the part that you come to grips with this, where the ego falls away. And so it's very common. So that might sound a little heady to some people, but in my journey, I have to be honest with you, following that, I dedicated myself to slowing my life down entirely um, I give tremendously with joy. I have not um, been in a relationship, and I'm going to tell you that I actually finally have a relationship with myself. Um, even in the midst of a world pandemic like this, I've um, never felt happier, more peaceful, um, more at ease. And some of the things that I'm observing, I'm a runner, and when I run normally, I run on the street. I know even though I've been hit by a car, uh, bicyclists often come towards me, and even though I get out of their way, they tend to give me that middle finger to let me know what they think. Um, they're saying hello. I'm seeing whole families of different ethnicities and sizes and colors and shapes walking. 
I'm noticing kids on bike instead of on video games. Um, one of the things that uh, I noticed too outside of the hello, and I wrote a couple of things on what, um, what I noticed that was, was changing around me was um, also how many people have reached out I haven't talked to, I don't even know when, off of social media, looking to connect. Um, I've noticed how many people are, are a please and a thank you and a kindness following up. One of the things that my family started to do um, is that for those of you are more, I'm 50 years old. So growing up the diary of Anne Frank and studying the Holocaust was huge. And so we're all writing um, COVID-19 journals, you know, what's going on in Australia? What's going on for you? What about if your family were to write down, what are the changes in your job, in your mood, in your behaviors? Um, this is really taking an impact on young people. I know in America for our teenagers that are very connected yet disconnected. Um, there's an art group here from Montalvo Arts in Northern California. California that was launching a study called um, Together Alone, trying to figure out why there was a rise in suicide and different behaviors. If we're more connected than ever, why are we more alone? It's because the truth is, is now I think more than ever you understand, just doing this and having the phone isn't the same as this. Um, and I think that there'll be a great amount of good that will come from this as people remember to sing and to laugh and to write and to um, spend time with their loved ones and their family. So one of the things I want to say about families out there that are going through a lot of the um, homeschool challenges, I'm just going to tell you what's going on for me and my teens, okay? Because we're no stranger to suicide and loss and dealing with that ourselves as well. Um, around here, we have online schooling. So we get up, you know, normally we'd be up like 536 every day. We're waking up about 830, which is a treat. We'll have breakfast together. The kids sign into online school. I go out and I um, run. Uh, again, it's alone out here. There's no one actually around. You stay six feet apart. But then all of my business now is on consultation. I'm packed, um, lots of podcasts. And so we do our a thing and they go do their work and then we get together for lunch. I don't, I can't even tell you the last time I had lunch with my children. Then um, after that, they'd finish up their stuff. I finish up my work and then we get some out time, outside time. We ended up adopting a new dog that needed help in a shelter. Um, and then we take that time to journal that we're talking about, even 15, 20 minutes, it's no big deal. And we sit down for our day um, at dinner. We're very blessed to have the food that we've prepared for, but we've also been able to share that with other people. And I'll be honest with you, three months from now, that may not be us. We may not have the ability to sit down to dinner, but I'm not gonna occupy today with what might happen three months from now, because that brings us back to those three things I shared with you. Number one, the fear and anxiety of not controlling what's coming. There's a giant lesson in this on mental health, on learning to sit in the moment. I have friends that have called trying to identify what they're going through. They're like, is it grief? Is it this? And here's what it is. When you're a very social person who identifies by your clothing, the way you look, being sort of looked up to, and that is suddenly taken from you, that is actually your ego. And as your ego goes to die away, it's going to put up a fight. And as it puts up a fight, you're going to feel it. And what you're going to feel are going to be strange feelings if you're not someone that's ever felt depression. Here's the good news. It's normal. It's normal. One of the things as human beings that sets us apart from animals and everyone else is that we have an ability to choose. One of my favorite people to study during Auschwitz was Viktor Frankl. He was a brilliant mind and teacher, but he wrote um, a book that is amazing book, but in it was a quote that says the last of the human freedoms is the ability to choose one's mindset in any given set of circumstances. He was explaining that no matter what was going on in the concentration camps, his freedom lied within here. There have been many people through World War II, one, different times in our country and in our world where this time it's not human against human, it's actually human for human. And one of the things that's great to learn to practice now is the fact that we actually are the only species on the planet with the choice in our emotions. Now, what I mean about that is like, well, I choose to be happy. Yes, many people say that, but here's what it means. In the state of a day where you might feel happiness come through and you might feel anxiety come through, or those three things we talked about, rejection and uncertainty or failure, you can have a feeling pass through. It doesn't have to take up space meaning I don't have to invite it to live with me. You actually, as a human being, have a choice. You have a choice in which when a joyous moment comes through to cling to that one. Allow that one to hang out a little longer. When the negative one comes through, take a look at it, acknowledge it and say, bye. 
this is going to be a great time for learning practices in my book. And this is not about selling a book. Okay. This is not, I wrote the book I needed to read because I don't want any of you to have to go through what I went through. And so if I can give you just one step further, then I would hope you would go further than I've gone. So if I could get to this place, I hope you go 10 times further than this. So one of the things I talk about, I say, okay, Leticia, that's all fine and good, but how do we do that? Well, in my volunteering, one of the camps I volunteer for is for an LGBTQ group, group called One in Ten. We do the largest gay camp is in the U.S. here in Arizona, and we have kids from all over the world that come. And we have something called SOS. SOS is what's identified as a source of strength to someone who is in depression or at risk of taking their life. And what that means is people think that back in the day of ships, it meant save our ship. It actually meant save our soul. It's what sailors thought as the ship was going down, please save our soul. What does that mean? It means I identify the things that bring me great joy without any thought. Meaning when I'm in a state of depression, I'm not gonna be like, hmm, what can I do to better myself? No, you're not gonna be thinking right. I'm a runner. So all I know is that I've just gotta look down, put on the shoes, don't put on the shoes, I don't care. Just walk out the door and start running. That's one of my SOSs. My dogs, my children. Music, I can put on certain songs and boom, it'll come back. Um, I also know certain songs not to put on because I can do it the other way. But identifying your sources of strength that are like instantaneous, meaning they're sitting right there. My daughter's a drawer. My son just has to pick up a football. Whatever that is, it's got to be something so simple that you don't have to think about it. It will immediately put you back in that right space. So all in all today, what I'm hoping to share with you more than anything is that the world is going through a change. And many of us that have already understood either chemical imbalance, um, hereditary um, imbalance on depression, but there's also what I call the hidden depression, those of us that are too afraid to be honest. And that's what this Imperfectly Perfect campaign is mostly about. But what myself included up until today has been about the pain that the people left behind by making that choice. Today, I decided to be a little more vulnerable and tell you about the time that I actually saw that opportunity in front of me and didn't take it and didn't even think twice about it. But it gave me apathy and empathy for those that did. It made me realize that if I were a different person or if a different set of education, finances, or time in my life, maybe younger if that had happened, that maybe I shouldn't be so judgmental of other people that do that. It's okay to understand and grieve the loss of a loved one and the pain that we're left behind. And I too myself know the anger that comes with that and some of the blame. But as I sat in that hotel room and I left that scar that I'm quite proud of on my arm, what I realized is that I understood them better now. I understood them better. And um, if they could hear me, <clears throat> and I believe they can, I would let them know it's okay. And um, I don't even need to say if I forgive you. What I need to say is I'm so sorry I wasn't more understanding. And I'll see you on the other side one day, many moons from now, but thank you for being there to prepare it for me. Because I have no doubt you're in heaven. So um, ultimately, while a lot of the concentration on this campaign has been about being honest about the feelings that we have and about the loved ones we've lost um, due to them not reaching out, I hope today is also about the understanding that it can happen to anyone. Please be kind and most of all, be kind to yourself. And as we enter into these uncharted territory and waters of isolation, of not being able to check in with the things that make us feel who we are, which by the way, aren't really even real. It's just how we get our ego in check to keep the day going. Um, those three things, fear and anxiety of the uncertain, disappointment and rejection, may all three or one or the other probably hit each and every home across this world. Um, take the time to sit in the feeling, but don't give it room to take root. Um, I remember when I was hit by the car, someone asked me, what's the greatest way to describe your life today since you have vertigo every day, you have seizures? And I said, well, um, I'm a person that lived my entire life uh, in joy with moments of despair and somehow God flipped the cards for me. And I live in tremendous despair with a few moments of joy, but I choose to hold on to those moments because um, once tragedy has struck, you will never be more aware of when joy comes back. And that I can tell you. So while this time is uncertain and we are in this together, um, you do have a choice. I'm not asking you to pretend to be happy. Um, I actually am happy and not because of any other reason that at this particular moment in this time, um, my mind is here with you and this is a joyous occasion. So 
I choose to be happy. Um, when a feeling might come through wondering, maybe some people will go online and bash me for this. Okay, as those feelings of rejection come through, I will acknowledge them, but they're not going to take up roots in my house. They're just not allowed to. So um, I hope in some cases this helps you. I know that Glenn is also doing Instagram Live and I'm more than happy to answer questions. Uh, Glenn got an early release copy of my book that I mailed to him um, for those of you that do want to know. It is called No Reserve, uh, which is an auction terminology. I am an auctioneer. Um, it is uh, available now for pre-order on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com um, <clears throat> for July delivery, which is really weird because I didn't pick that delivery date. My publisher, Sound Wisdom Publishing, and David Wilderson did, and I can't think of a more appropriate time as the world pops its head back out by July to have a little book that tells you about living your life without limitation, and the number one secret that I share in the book to overcoming adversity is to give when you have nothing. So on that note, as we are in self-isolation or self-containment or even mandatory, people always say, well, it's kind of like, I'll be happy when, well, I'll give when I have money, I'll give when I'm at a certain point. Give when you have nothing. What do you have right now? Time. Is there someone in your neighborhood that might be elderly that can't mow their lawn? You don't need to come in human contact to show up unannounced and mow a lawn at five in the morning. Um, perhaps that your children are having some trouble online schooling. I know that my son is a whiz at math. Maybe my kid could help tutor your kid. You know, there's a lot of things that don't involve money um, that simply involve compassion and time. I happen to know that Glenn is really good at one of my favorite types of giving and that's listening. Um, being a good ear is a tremendous gift that people can give. Um, Oprah Winfrey's a, I'm a fan of her podcast and they all begin with that she believes the greatest gift um, that we can give ourselves is time. And um, at this point, uh, time is the one thing, and again, I apologize for these lovely messages popping through, but time is the one thing, hey, we got it right now. Um, it's a great gift to give yourself. Start taking a look um, as these feelings arise, write them down. Uh, don't be afraid to ask for help. Don't be afraid to reach out for forums. Um, my book does hit all the shelves, is international. Um, we'll be in Barnes and Noble, we'll be in Amazon, we'll be in airport stores. Yes, eventually we will get back in an airport. Um, and uh, that comes out in July, but you can pre-order it now. But I'm also, I'm, I'm, I'm on Instagram at Letitia underscore Fry. My website's LetitiaFry.com. As Glenn knows, you ask me a question, um, you get me. So um, unless you're going to say something absolutely absurd and wacky, I'm going to block you, let's face it. Uh, you know, I'm not a fool, but, um, <laughs> but by all means, if you ask, um, it's going to be me. It's kind of like Glenn when he said, hey, would you hop on a plane to do this? I'm like, sure, why not? You know, <laughs> so um, and that's a lot of what my book is about. Some of you are going to um, lose a job. Okay, so here's a little bit of a silver lining that's in my book. A lot of people are walking through their lives mindlessly in jobs they hate. I mean, that's the truth. And underneath it, they've always wanted to write a children's book. They've always wanted to be a singer. Or they've always wanted to be a teacher. Or they've always wanted to have some, something to do with airplanes or whatnot. That's called passion. And in my book, I talk about passion before a paycheck. Unfortunately, right now, that may just be the case. So if there isn't any paycheck and you have to do something to bring in money, Glenn and I are no strangers to having to do what we have to do. For him, it's construction. For me, it used to be walking dogs and bartending. Um, you know, you got to do what you do to put food on the table. But I bet you that little passion thing that you've said you've had no time to dive into right now probably could get a little attention. This is probably a gift. And maybe, just maybe, as you look to reinvent yourself because you have to, because that job you thought you were gonna retire from suddenly disappeared and everything with it, maybe that one life that you've always envisioned and dreamed you could have, maybe now's the time to get into it. So I hope if anything, I could give you a little bit of hope and possibly just a lot of honesty and um, let you know that um, I don't regret that day and I don't regret the work and the journey that I've taken to me. Um, Cause in knowing me gets back to source and by source, I mean for me, where we come from, where are we going? Um, that sense of peace and love that doesn't require the validation of anyone anywhere or anything. It's um, a lovely feeling to have. It's not easy. There's a reason um, and it's not easy to maintain. It's a choice every day, all day, 24 hours a day. So. 
Glenn, any questions from anybody or anything you want to comment since you're doing what you do best, which is listen? <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say, like, for anybody that is listening to this podcast, like, the reason that our, our first meeting was actually through the means of a free resource, which was Instagram and somebody posting this raw, transparent, authentic message, which just resonated with me to what the campaign was about, the premise of the campaign, and it was just unfiltered, real. It was just reality, and that, it just attracted me so much, and then I had to click onto your profile, have a look, and that's what initially made me reach out to you, and the thing about you that I absolutely love and I find so inspirational, and, and I could sit here, I, I, I love everyone's story. I'm a big believer in everyone's got a story, so I, in terms of being empathetic, I could sit here for, I've always listened to someone's story. I, I just think it's so, I get so ingrained in people's story because you can take away and you can learn a lot. And one of the things that I took away from you, and I don't know if I've ever told you this, but firstly, I will say that if, if you want to grab this book, guys, do. Because what I love about it is, as you sit here talking now, the authenticity just pours from you. You're so transparent, you're so honest. And what we see and what we attribute to looking at your, maybe your online, uh, your online account where we see you with some of the biggest celebrities in the world. Again, that's not taking away how successful you are because in my eyes, you're that influential public figure. And what we see at a time when there's people on stage, there's lights, there's camera, there's action, and the confidence just spills out of you. Mm. You, to break it down, and just show your authenticity. I think through this book, a lot of people can obviously learn from. I did. But what I want to do is finish off with something that I took away. And I always say it. And I always, I always give you credit, Letitia, because it's an, an analogy that you told me to start putting yourself first. And the way that you looked at it was thinking about being on a plane with those that you loved. So if you can just finish off with telling everybody that analogy, because I think it is absolutely incredible. I did. And, and just so you know, that raw post that Glenn is referring to was my way of quietly trying to tell the world that I had had that moment in Atlanta. And I chose to put that out there. And not only did Glenn respond, I had four people that are probably some of the most high profile people in the world quietly tell me they had almost taken their life in the next 24 hours. So um, sometimes those posts are the posts that change. So here's what I told Glenn when I landed, because remember, I flew in. And so I've heard this expression before, but I was reminded as the stewardess was getting up to do their routine, she said, remember, put your mask on first. Even if you're traveling with children, put your mask on first. In other words, if you're not being able to breathe or help everybody in a matter of seconds, you're not gonna be able to help the child on your right or your wife or husband on your left, put your mask on first. So one of the things I wanna leave you with, Glenn, is a big misnomer about the word self-care. It's very PC right now, people say self-care, and here's what self-care is for me. I was asked recently in an interview. For me, it's self-examination. A lot of people think it means I took a nap or I got a pedicure. I mean, that's just, you should be doing that anyway. That's called balance. <clears throat> Let me just take a sip of water because this is important. Self-care is self-examination. I sat within myself and took an honest inventory of the things I'm doing that are not healthy for me. One of them was because I traveled so much and used to take Ambien CR like every single night. Um, another one was I just slam cholesterol medicine every day. Um, I drank too much wine. I mean, I literally had to sit and hold accountability. And self-care was actually making permanent change. I got off Ambien CR and I sleep great. I stopped my cholesterol medicine. I mean, I'm, what am I taking it for anyway? I just had to adjust a couple of things in my diet. And then I stopped drinking three to four nights a week. Okay, I'll be totally honest, this last week with a little bit of stress, the wine was at the dinner. <laughs> but as a whole, and again, you got to forgive yourself on moments here and there. It's just, it, it was about balance. So for me, what self-care and putting your mask on first means, let's take an honest look and sit down and say, what am I doing to prevent myself from being the absolute best version I could be? Because there's probably a couple things within my control, because that goes back to the first thing. I can't change you. I can't change Glenn. I can't change anyone, but I can change me. And sometimes as I do that, I then become the example and the catalyst 
to help the people around me want to be better too. And then we all end up having a better experience ourselves. Amazing. Amazing. So inspirational. And I could sit and talk to you, as I say, for absolutely yeah. Leticia. I think you're an amazing. Uh, lady. Um, so what I will do, <clears throat> I'll, I'll shoot some of the questions through to you. Um, Please. There, are some, there are some personal questions that have been coming up, so I'll send them through so you can. Okay. I mean, one good thing about Leticia is she's a big believer in getting back people who send personal things through. Um, and that's one thing yeah. I wished about you as well. Yeah. You even caught up with Jennifer that connected us through that post. Yeah. I, oh, Jennifer Deputy, I'm sure if you're out there watching, mm, big kudos to her. She's such an honest advocate for all of this. She's been great. She's, uh, she's wonderful. She's become a good, a good Instagram friend and, and friend in general, you know? She's amazing. But um, yeah, again, on behalf of myself and the campaign for everything you do for it and push it out in the US and just, just being there for me, basically, in, in terms of yeah. self-development. And they always say that you can look to people as mentors. And every time I've reached out for you and asked you a question, you've been there straight away. So again, that's a personal thank you to me because it's made me a better person towards me. Of course. And, and those of you that are listening, I'm just let you know, this is a, when I get on something personal, I am going to help Glenn. I don't care if it's the last thing I ever do. We're going to bring the Imperfectly Perfect campaign to a much larger U.S. presence and figure out a way to do fundraising across continents and really help him to get to the level he needs because these are messages and his platform that he created, whether he did this as a passion project for a lost friend, what he has stumbled upon is truthfully what the world needs now more than ever, particularly in the midst of what a virus that is leveling us all out. So please do support the Imperfectly Perfect campaign. If this is your first time coming on, do spread the word as well, but know that as a fundraiser from the United States, I am going to make it my mission to help bring this campaign closer here and to help Glenn do this fundraising um, so that we can have this message shared across all platforms in every country across the world. Well, I truly appreciate that. And um, yeah, from the bottom of my heart and my family's heart, I mean, thank you for your time, Leticia. Yeah. yeah. And, and Glenn, do me a favor. Yeah. Um, send me the personal questions with the accounts they came from and I will answer them myself. Like I said, if you're going to be crazy on them, no. <laughs> but if you're going to be normal, yes. That's so, the thing about Leticia. She doesn't suffer fools gladly. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. Not at all. And I have no filter. And I mean that literally. Like I don't use a filter on my face and I don't use a filter on my mouth. Probably a downfall for both. And that's a good thing Thanks, about it. Glenn. But uh, for anybody that's tuning into this, you can subscribe, check it out on YouTube. I will be filtering it through YouTube, all the social media platforms, iHeartRadio and Spotify. And I put all Letitia's links up, so be sure to follow and check her out. She does incredible work. But again, thank you, Letitia, for your time. Thanks, Ben. Say hi to the wife and kids. I love them. And yours. <laughs> Bye-bye.